We've already talked a little bit about vectors in this class um, and we've defined them, but we haven't really talked much about how you use them and how you work with them. And that's what we're going to start digging into today because a lot of what you're going to deal with for the rest of the semester has to do with vectors. So we need to really understand how we add and subtract vectors, how we describe them, and just in general how we work with them. Before we talk about how we work with them, we need a little review of what they are. So a vector is a quantity that has both a magnitude, say five meters per second, and a direction, so to the north. Or so far, we've used positive and negative a lot because we've just worked in one dimension. We've just worked along a straight line. A scalar just has magnitude. So sometimes there can be a scalar that sort of if you add a direction to it could be a vector. Something like speed is a scalar. So you would just say your speed is five meters per second. And then if you add a direction, that becomes a vector. Other things are really kind of always a scalar. Something like temperature, you can't really put a direction to temperature. So you can't really make it into a vector. When we deal with vectors, we have to always take into consideration that direction. Again, thinking about when we worked in one dimension, if I went positive five meters and then negative three meters, my total distance traveled might have been eight meters, but my displacement was only two meters because I have to take into account those positive and negative signs. You've actually kind of added vectors before in your life, but maybe didn't know it. So this is a sort of cartoonish map of downtown Lynchburg taken from the visitor center. And say I started to go for a walk there and I walk three blocks up Main Street. I take a left onto 8th Street and go three blocks there. We could see each of these as a displacement. And a displacement for three blocks in this direction a displacement for three blocks along 8th Street, and then we'll go two blocks, two blocks, and one more block. Each of these is a vector, right? It has some length, three blocks, and a direction. Um, we're not going to worry too much about cardinal directions now, but you can see that each one of these has a direction. What we've done is sort of add each of these displacements together. I had a displacement from here to here, and then from here to here, here to here, here to here, and here to here, so that my total displacement would be just from where I started my walk to where I ended my walk. That's really how we add vectors. We always say that we add them head to tail, which means we join the head and the tail. So a little anatomy of a vector because you may not have heard those terms very much before. The head of the vector is sort of the direction it's pointing, it's where the arrow is. If it's a displacement, it's where you end up. Um, and the tail of the vector is the starting point. Thinking of adding these vectors together is usually pretty easy when we think about displacements. It is a little bit more challenging for people when we think of adding vectors that are velocity vectors or acceleration or forces, but we use the same basic ideas. So if you think about it in terms of adding displacement vectors, that will get you in the right direction. So the first rule of vector addition is that you don't talk about vector addition. I know that was a really bad Fight Club joke, but I figure you're stuck listening to me. I can at least make bad jokes every now and then. So the first rule of vector addition is that the vector sum of A and B is found by adding vector A plus vector B. We do head to tail, so that the head of vector A is matched with the tail of vector B. And then vector S, the sum of the two, goes from the tail of A to the head of B. So that's the vector sum of A and B. What would we do if our vectors were like this? They weren't automatically put in the same place for us. Well, vectors can be picked up and moved around. It doesn't matter where A and B start off, their sum is the same. I would just move A and then move B and get the same vector S as their sum from before. 
So it doesn't matter where they are to start, when we add a and b, we would get that same vector s. And graphically, it's found by doing it head to tail. We'll look at how to do it sort of numerically or algebraically in a little bit, but it's really important to understand how we do it graphically first, because that's how you really understand what you're doing in vector addition. Okay, so given vectors a and b below, so here's a, which is a horizontal vector, b is a shorter vertical vector pointing downwards, which of the following, one, two, three, four, or five, shows the addition of those two vectors. So continuing to think about vector addition, we know that in addition, if I had five plus two, that's the same thing as two plus five. That's the commutative law. And that works for vector addition as well. If I had A and then B, I get this vector sum S. If I add B and then A, as is shown here, where I start with B and then I add A, I also get S. So these two are equal. Again, the two vector S's that I have shown here aren't shown in the same place. That doesn't matter. They don't need to be in the same place to be the same vector. We also have an associative law. We also have an associative law. So what we're saying is that if we add A and B together and then add C, that's the same thing as if we add B and C together first and then add A. So we're gonna step through this. So I have vector A and vector B and conveniently they're already in line to add together and get vector S. So we know that A plus B equals S. So I can get rid of A and B and just have S. And what I'm doing is representing this a plus b by their sum s. If I then add c to it, I get this vector as the sum of a plus b plus c. Okay, I'm going to leave that vector there, and now I'm going to add b plus c. Find the sum of those two. I'm going to remove b and c just like I did before because they're represented by their sum. Again, this is just like doing addition regularly. If I was going to add 5 plus 2 plus 3, I could add 5 and 2 to get 7, and then add 7 plus 3 to get 10. That's all we're doing here. So I get rid of B and C. I add A, and what I see is I get the same vector that I did when I added A and B together first. So I can group these however I want and get the same final result. We can also subtract vectors. So subtraction is always finding the difference. And so we're going to let a vector d be the difference of a and b. So a minus b. And that's going to equal to a plus negative b. Again, this is a lot like what you've done in math before, that 2 minus 1 is the same as 2 plus negative 1. But we need to first define what negative b is. So if this is vector b here, negative b has the same length, so the same magnitude, but opposite direction. You can kind of picture it as just moving the arrow point to the other end. So the two vectors will always be parallel, and they will always have the same length, but the direction will change by 180 degrees. So if I have a plus negative b, that gives me d, and vector d is the difference between a and b. Thinking about that, we have vector b shown here. <laughs> 
and you want to choose from all of the options below one, two, three, four, and five, which one represents negative B? So if this is B, which of these is negative? Okay, so we've learned some of our rules. Now we want to figure out which of these is always true. We have four statements and only one of them will always be true. Some of the others might be true, but only one will always be true. Now we have a figure shown here and we want to express the vector E in terms of vectors A and B. You'll notice on all of the previous slides I had the arrows over vectors and that's really how we identify a term as a vector and not a scalar. So we have E with an arrow over it, A with an arrow over it, and B with an arrow over it. I didn't do that here which is a little bit sloppy of me um, simply because it's a pain to do in PowerPoint. So I'm going to tell you that these are all vectors. In general, if you just see the letter without the arrow, it's representing the magnitude, not the entire vector. But in this case, it is representing all of the vectors. I just didn't go through and put all those arrows over the top. So here we have vector E, which goes from here to here. And you want to write an equation, an expression, that expresses E in terms of vector A, which goes from here to here, and vector B, which goes from here to here. Same figure, same thing that I didn't put all the arrows on everything, and I apologize. So in this case, we have vector D, which goes here, to here and vector C which goes here to here and you want to express D minus C in terms of vectors A which goes here to here and B. It doesn't have to be in terms of both A and B it can be one or the other but how would you write an equation so that D minus C equals something to do with A and or B. I told you that we aren't always going to add vectors graphically and in fact you're actually not going to do it very much at all. How you're typically going to add vectors is using components. So a component of a vector is a projection of the vector on an axis. And when we find the components of the vector, we also call that resolving the vector. So if I have vector A here, coming from the origin out in this direction, I'm gonna make this the positive x-axis, this the positive y-axis. And what I wanna do is find the component, so the projection of this vector onto both the y-axis and onto the x-axis. So when I talk about the projection onto an axis, you can think about it as if you looked straight down onto this axis, or sorry, onto this vector, how much of the axis would be blocked. You could also say if I had a huge light here that was a really broad light like the sun, what would be the shadow that A would cast on the x-axis? And it's found just by creating a line that is perpendicular to the x-axis to the tip of vector A. So in this case, A sub X, which is the component of vector A along the X axis, is negative five meters. To find the Y component, we do the same thing. We imagine if we looked straight from this side, how much of the Y axis would be blocked? In this case, it's positive 4.5 meters. We see that A is in the positive Y and negative as you can imagine, we're, we're not really going to make you 
look and draw 90 degree angles because that would be quite tiresome. What we're going to do is use some of the properties of right triangles to solve this. So you can see an example with a different vector a here. Another thing that you'll notice is the vector does not need to start at the origin. It can be anywhere. And if we remember, we made right angles when we made our a sub x, our x component of a, and our y component of a. So what we have is a right triangle here with a as the hypotenuse and a sub x along the bottom, a sub y sort of as the vertical component. If you remember back, we can think of that in terms of the Pythagorean theorem. So the sine of theta, if theta is our angle made with the positive x axis. So when I say the angle made with the positive x axis, I mean right here. It can also be a line parallel to the positive x axis. So if my vector a went this direction, I would still measure theta from here and it would simply be an angle greater than 90 degrees. So the sine of theta is going to be the opposite, the side opposite that angle, divided by the hypotenuse. In this case, that's a sub y divided by a. These purposefully don't have the vector signs here because we're just dealing with positive and negative. These don't have a true direction. You do need to keep in mind the positive and negative. If a sub y is negative, it needs to be negative here. If a sub x is negative, it needs to be negative here. The cosine is equal to the adjacent, the side adjacent to the angle theta divided by the hypotenuse. And so cosine is a sub x divided by a, the length of vector a. And the tangent is equal to the opposite divided by the adjacent. So a sub y divided by a sub x. As you can see, if we know this angle theta and we know the length of vector a, we could solve for a sub y. And that's how we solve for the components of vectors is a sub x is equal to the length of vector a times the cosine of theta. Remember, theta is always measured in reference to the positive x-axis or a line parallel to the positive x-axis. And a sub y is equal to a times the sine of theta. We can actually represent vectors in two ways. We sometimes use component notation. So a sub x and a sub y. So we would say a sub x equals 4 meters, a sub y equals negative 4 meters. If I have both of those numbers, I can figure out the magnitude and the direction of vector a. So that's all I need. I don't need anything further to fully describe what vector a is. There's only one direction vector a could go and only one length vector a could be. Just like that. We can also describe it using magnitude angle notation. So in magnitude angle notation, not too surprisingly, we list the magnitude or the length of the vector and then that angle theta that it makes with the positive x-axis. So in this case it would be 6.5 meters negative 45 degrees. So it's measured down from the positive x-axis. You could also describe this by measuring all the way around like this and get positive 315 degrees. Most people use negative 45 um, in negative values between 0 and 90, but that's really up to you. We can go back and forth between component notation and magnitude angle notation really easily. So the length of A is actually found just using the Pythagorean theorem. If you remember, it was a right triangle, and the Pythagorean theorem tells us that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And that's A squared is the length of one side of the triangle, plus B squared, the length of the other side of the triangle, equals C squared. And here we just go ahead and take the square root of the squares of the two sides of the triangle. 
We can also find the angle theta using tangent or inverse tangent. We already said that the tangent of theta equals to a sub y divided by a sub x, or the y component divided by the x component, and we can use that to figure out what the angle theta would be. Or if we already know the angle theta, we can use that to figure out how a, y, and ax relate. So what about three dimensions? You're going to kind of have to bear with me through this for a little bit. I'm also going to post another video that explains this as well in case this isn't really clear. So what I've done is draw a three-dimensional axis here. So we have one axis here, one axis here that you can kind of envision pointing out of the screen, and one here going up and down. Each axis is 90 degrees to all of the others. So if I have the x, y, and z axis, and I have a vector that is three positive units in the x direction, and two positive units in the y direction, I could add them together and get a vector with a length square root of three squared plus two squared units. I've then put a sort of gray shaded area underneath here to show you where that plane is, the xy plane in this vector that we have that has a length of square root of three squared plus two squared units is in that xy plane. I'm now going to remove my x component and my y component because I have the sum of the two of them already represented. Now I want to add a z component. So if I have a vector that is one unit tall in z, this is I think the part where it gets hardest to visualize, so bear with me. I'm going to add that vector to the vector that was the sum of my x and y components by moving it so I have it head to tail. And now I have a sum of those two vectors that comes from the origin and goes to the tip of that vector that is one unit tall in the z direction. Again, I know this is hard to see. PowerPoint is not the best in the world for drawing 3D pictures. But if I take these three vectors that I have here, and I'm going to turn them around, what we really have is we have that vector with length 3 squared plus 2 squared, and then take the square root of that. We have the vector that is one unit tall, and we have the sum of those two vectors. We can find the length of this vector just using the Pythagorean theorem again. We say that Instead, we have, we're going to name this vector c, that was our first sum of vectors, and c squared is now 3 squared plus 2 squared units plus 1 unit. So when we do 3 squared plus 2 squared plus 1 squared and take the square root of that, that gives us the length of this vector. So we can kind of write the Pythagorean theorem is a squared plus b squared plus d squared, which is going to be this 1 unit value, equals e squared, and e squared is the square of the length of this vector. So our a squared is thinking all the way back to where we had our x component, b squared is where we had the y component, d squared is this z component, and then e squared is the square of the length of this resulting vector. If this doesn't make any sense, you have a couple options. One, you can just trust me and say, I know I can basically use the Pythagorean theorem in three dimensions, and when I have a vector that has an x, y, and z component, and I want to find the length of it, I'm just going to square the x component, square the y component, square the z component, add those together, and take the square root, and that'll be the length of my vector. Or, again, I've posted a link on Moodle to some additional videos to help explain this.